Reassurance Initiative, which next year should spend about $4.8 billion, not only funding all these exercises, but putting in place more pre-positioned equipment and helping to pay for the upgrade of various military infrastructure, such as airfields or seaports, among the Eastern members of the NATO alliance. So you get this kind of alphabet soup uh, of, of different NATO initiatives on deterrence and defense. Now, for balance, NATO also wanted to balance, you know, have a, a third D uh, of dialogue with Russia to complement these moves. And that was symbolized especially by the resumptions of talks in Brussels under the framework of the so-called NATO-Russia Russia Council. Uh, those talks had not taken place for about two years from the spring of 2014 to the spring of, of last year. Uh, they've now resumed, and according to some of the NATO diplomats I've talked to, uh, these talks are valuable for at least two separate reasons. Uh, the first is that they do have a kind of channel of communication which is important for expressing concerns and hopefully avoiding misunderstandings with Russia that could escalate to a, a higher level of conflict. Uh, however, the, the second type of benefit is that in an alliance of 28, now 29 members with different priorities and viewpoints, nothing is more powerful for generating unity than listening to the Russian ambassador for a couple of hours. Uh, so this is also perhaps a, a benefit of the dialogue. And uh, a third kind of uh, pillar of the, the NATO approach that has gotten a little bit less attention but was another of the, the main outcomes of the Warsaw Summit was this initiative around the idea of resilience. Uh, the idea that NATO members should be able to do more to uh, cope with unpredictable range of, of security threats, uh, certainly including this kind of low-level hybrid warfare as practiced by Russia. This was featured in a couple of different respects at Warsaw. Uh, the, within the main summit declaration, one of the articles identified resilience as a key enabler for collective defense. Uh, there was a separate document on enhancing allied resilience. And then resilience was also a, a prominent theme in a, a document on strengthening strategic partnership with the European Union. So this idea of being able to, uh, to have a a robust ability to respond to a whole range of crises, uh, to be able to use the military and other security uh, resources of governments for civil defense, and also to be able to cope with hybrid warfare through stronger strategic communication are all elements of this increased focus on, on resilience. Uh, so this is kind of the, uh, the, the four minute summary of what NATO has been doing. Uh, looking forward, there's a couple of, of questions I think that, that remain. Uh, the first is the natural one is, is all this enough? Uh, as we begin to prepare uh, to pay attention to the next Russia exercise, such as Zapod 17 with 100,000 forces, uh, is a few battalions in the Baltic states and, and Poland or a few additional exercises enough to respond to a, a full-scale Russian threat? Uh, the pessimist would say maybe not. Uh, they would look to various studies, such as one by the RAND Corporation, that estimated you need not four or 5,000 troops on the ground, but perhaps something closer to seven brigades or 30 to 35,000 troops to really meaningfully be able to cope with a, a potential Russia attack. Uh, the optimist, would, on the other hand, would say it's not so much the total numbers, but the, the symbolism and political meaning of this presence. Uh, they will recall that during the, the Cold War, uh, the West German Chancellor in the 1950s, Konrad Adenauer, was at once asked, how many American troops do you need in Western Germany to feel safe from a Soviet invasion? And his famous answer was one. Um, as long as I have one, uh, and the, Russian, the Soviets know that if this person dies, you face the entire uh, re reaction from the United States. So perhaps this kind of of dynamic applies here, but to the extent it does, it requires uh, also the ability to quickly return and reinforce these NATO forces on the ground, which means more money uh, and also uh, logistical improvements and legislative permissions to move them to where they need to be. Uh, a second, I think, ongoing question for NATO about this response is how to balance the response to the Russian threat on the so-called eastern flank with other security challenges for the alliance. Uh, it likes to talk about itself as being a 360 degree kind of organization. And in particular right now, I can think of at least two other kinds of challenges uh, that are, are significant. 
Uh, one is this challenge that is sometimes referred to as the, the southern flank. Uh, the challenge is related to the overflow of migration or terrorism from the Middle East and North Africa in re recent years, uh, which is identified by several of the Mediterranean members of the alliance as their top priority, and which even the U.S. Secretary of State uh, Tillerson hinted was perhaps uh, the most important for the U.S. as well when it comes to, to terrorism. Uh, over the longer term, perhaps, though, another challenge will be how do you deal with the, the Near Eastern threat of, of Russia with the mix of challenges and opportunity of a rising Far East, uh, represented by China, India, and the broader Asia-Pacific region. Uh, so this was a, a question during the Obama administration, the, the issue of the, the pivot. Uh, but I think it also going, going forward will remain a, a question for the U.S. and for other European members of NATO. How do we balance these commitments to each other with our efforts to deal with the events in the Asia Pacific? So I think it's, uh, it's very notable that uh, tomorrow's version of this roundtable will focus precisely on, on that question. And, and last but not least, a third kind of issue going forward for, for NATO's response is this question of whether, given the other kinds of differences among the members of the alliance, uh, whether those differences will somehow undermine the, the unity and, and solidarity of the response vis-a-vis -vis Russia and hybrid warfare. Uh, to name just a few that you can pluck from the headlines, the, the ongoing drama of, of Brexit, uh, the United Kingdom's withdrawal from the European Union, uh, debates within the EU on building a kind of multi-speed framework for the future, uh, which pits sometimes Germany and France on the one hand with members from Central and East European uh, members uh, in this part of, of, of Europe on the other, uh, and also the, the ongoing question of differing views of the Russia threat. Uh, again, there has been, I think, a basic agreement on a set of robust measures, both in terms of, uh, of the military response and economic sanctions. Uh, but this may not last into the future, and again, this is one of the, uh, the issues that's being watched very carefully, uh, also in involving U.S.-Russian relations. Uh, so for NATO going forward, it has already identified a couple of the next steps it wants to take in the next two to three years to cope with these remaining unresolved issues. Uh, NATO is talking about having another summit in the summer of 2018, probably in, in Brussels, and leading up to here, the next buzzword that will be the focus of the alliance apparently will be this idea of coherence. Uh, how do you bring all these different initiatives vis-a-vis -vis Russia, but also vis-a-vis -vis other challenges together into a, a kind of integrated fashion so they don't compete with each other? And perhaps if this can be achieved in, in 2018, uh, going forward in uh, 2019 or 2020, would be an effort to revise the existing strategic concept document of the alliance, which dates from 2010, uh, a very different period in European security, uh, but to try to use this kind of updating process as an opportunity to debate and come to a real consensus among the, the allies on where the relative priorities lie. Uh, so thanks for your attention. Uh, I'll be also watching what NATO is doing in the next two years very carefully and hope that uh, these next summits will be equally important to, to Poland as Warsaw last year. Thanks. Thank you very much. It's great to be back to Warsaw. Uh, nothing is more disappointing for a good Hungarian than seeing Warsaw, Prague, and Bratislava developing much faster than his or her own nation's capital. Okay, on a less sobering note, and it's beautiful what I see, what I see over here, I started to come to Warsaw in 1980, so not yesterday, but a little bit earlier. Uh, I have written notes because I never could otherwise make it in 12 minutes, unlike my colleagues who are so self-disciplined. I would start by saying that history never ends. And of course, at the same time, the speed of historical change varies. Sometimes not many things happen, sometimes a lot of things happen. And during the last few years, the changes in European security have again gained speed. Ukraine, protracted conflict, or a protracted conflict in the making, I don't think we will escape it. Brexit, a tragedy. Eurozone crisis, migrant crisis, and Donald Trump in the White House. 
And please remember that I said a tragedy when I mentioned Brexit. Okay. Uh, this has resulted in a shake-up of international relations. Objective circumstances, and I'm going to address East Central Europe, how the East Central Europeans relate to this matter. Uh, there are three fundamentals. The first one is the absence of great powers, and as a consequence, the dependence upon external security providers. The second, that history determined the role and allegiance of small and medium-sized East Central European countries, and the third one is that the fact these states un unisono changed their allegiances taken involuntarily after World War II did not change their size or power. As a consequence, they have remained policy takers or at best policy shapers. What happens now, or more precisely put in the last more than a decade, is important, but it's not a paradigm shift. This is not a paradigm shift, unlike the end of the Cold War. The changes are important, as they may indicate more lasting rearrangement of power relations or tremors. The Russian Federation, and I say three things about it, is back on stage. Its punch is way above its weight. At the same time, its strengths and weaknesses are widely stretched. As a consequence, unlike smart great powers that rely on their strengths, and do their best to diversify their power base, like China or India. Russia diversifies very little, if at all. And the consequence of this is that it stands on its strong foot. There is one area where Russia has been more successful than its predecessor, the Soviet Union, and that's its propaganda machinery. After some hesitation to accept the junior partner status, it turned it's back on the system and has been trying to upset it. What we see in front of our eyes is an attempt to rearrange power relations, and not only in the post-Soviet space any longer, but somewhat beyond. Russia is back on the Western Balkans, Russia is there in Syria, and Russia is trying very actively to divide up East Central Europe. It's open to question whether its efforts will be successful or whether Moscow will end up in an imperial overstretch like Paul Kennedy described back in the 1980s. While in the post-Soviet space, Moscow is ready to use a full continuum of tools, including the employment of military power, the same cannot be ascertained in those areas where Russia has returned more recently. Russia uses its power tools but is not employing military force. Whether it's a success of our deterrent or whether it's the absence of intention is something that we have to speculate about. The aim of Russia is to create divisions, gain influence, establish positions, and preferably weaken United Western positions and influence. Propaganda, credits, investments, corruption, useful idiots are all welcome. States that have claim that have claims that can be supported at relatively low cost are all fitting well in the Russian scheme. Think about Serbia. Serbia's Kosovo claim is backed up, while Russia keeps a diplomatic representation in Pristina with 26 diplomats in an unrecognized entity, which is quite funny. Uh, Hungary did something similar in the 1930s, when its revanchist claims were backed by Nazi Germany. Now, of course, does Russia want to break up the West as we know it? It depends. Weakening Western unity. But some of these players are weakening Western unity as long as they are sitting around the table. Not that they are standing up and walking out. It's already good enough if sanctions are not deepening uh, and that contribution of some countries is valuable. And of course, Russia is much listened in some capitals and much less in others. It is listened to in Budapest, Sofia, Belgrade. How interesting, Turkey stream. Continuation in these directions, not in other directions. Or in Banja Luka, and somewhat less in Sarajevo. Luckier are those that have solid and lasting foundation to base their position uh, to Russia in turbulent times. This applies certainly to Poland and the Baltic states, so as to Romania. East Central Europe has never been one entity. 
As a consequence, it would be an illusion to speak about it. The countries of East Central Europe have gone through uneven development over the last quarter of a century. If we look at the matter through a different lens, there is reason to conclude that there are internal divisions and external pooling factors that result in clearer than ever differentiation. The political course of the East Central European countries is growing apart. This is something that we did not hear in the morning. However, in some issues, they share the same view, including the rejection of hosting refugees in one form or the other. Furthermore, the East Central European states have shared interest in maintaining the EU's resource reallocation system. The disagreements are partly based on a divergent political course, while some want to adhere to democratic values and principles and continue with democracy, others are interested in perpetuating their power nearly at any cost. There are variations of populism, but not every one of them presents lasting danger to the model that each and every Central European state declared to embrace upon the end of the Cold War. There is at least one where power must not be lost due to the criminal nature of the regime. The international environment has also become more divisive. The model that curtails, if not outright, rejects democracy as political foundation advances rapidly, offers immediate advantages to those in power, including financial ones, and helps with the perpetuation of power. If elections could be effectively influenced against the will of a state that had very extensive state capacity, what could be done in a country where the governmental authorities act in collusion with the intruder? The Hungarian foreign minister, while his country is chairing the V4, expressed his view that the group is in very good shape and standing. He understandably failed to mention that the group's cohesion, except for some superficial concord as far as the resettlement of migrants inside the EU, is largely over. Let me make a detour here to address an issue that is less frequently mentioned, the underlying concept of differentiation based on self-differentiation lost its foundation. When the Visegrad Group started in 1991, and I happened to work in the foreign ministry of my country for some time during that period, I very well remember it was differentiation based on self-differentiation. The E4 is not standing out in East Central Europe any longer. States like Estonia and Slovenia have been performing better for a long time. Some others, like Romania, are catching up quickly, at least with Hungary. Hungary's authoritarian leadership gives eloquent demonstration of the fact that democratic transformation is reversible, democratic institutions can be weakened, checks and balances abolished, human rights undermined. His model is closely monitored and studied and occasionally followed in Warsaw. Fortunately, our Polish friends are more mature politically. The Hungarian leadership is also useful for some other states that can hide behind him with other populist, although less confrontational, agenda. Prime Minister Orbán's take the heat, confronts with Brussels, and others look better. I think leaders in Bratislava and Prague feel ashamed while Orbán gains popularity with confrontational style domestically. While Budapest and Warsaw share international interests, first and foremost in weakening the EU as a value community, making the, op the application of Article 7 of the Lisbon Treaty impossible, they are far apart in their strategic interests. For Viktor Orban, Moscow is a partner and role model and a source of income to extend further a sustainable economic situation beyond 2020. When he cannot buy Russian helicopters, he sends old ones there for repair. After repair, the helicopters still do not meet NATO standards, but rest assured, some reap some benefits. These factors understandably contribute to a significant weakening of regional cohesion and a partial rearrangement in East Central Europe. The weakening of V4 provides an opportunity to look for alternatives in Bratislava and Prague. As far as military security, beyond Poland, there are countries that take their defense commitment seriously and others which are less vehement on this. 
take Romania, whose president found his way to the White House, and Warsaw that hosted the US president for a few hours just a few days ago. Rest assured, Hungary's government will also wake up after the elections of spring 2018, noticing that defense procurement plus the chance of misappropriation of funds with the help of secrecy is a great combination. In sum, we are at the parting of the ways where rearrangement is well underway, but no end in sight yet. Thank you. Good afternoon. This is not very easy to now in this moment to add something original and interesting after you. However, I would like comment two issues and raise the one new issue concerning with the Polish defense policy. First one, the Russia. For sure to understand the Russia, this is a very, uh, this is this is a very big challenge. Even in the Soviet era uh, was born a new area of science, the Sovietology, but in fact the main problem is that we don't know what is going behind the Kremlin doors. Uh, we don't know what, we don't know even what is the fit and the condition, the health condition of the Russian leader, is it fit, healthy or not? This is a question mark. Uh, Russians were able to surprise the world many times. Uh, we've got many examples for this. One is uh, Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact. Uh, this is a situation in Georgia in 2008. This is a Russian activity in Crimea in the 2014, 2000 uh, and. And, this, and the development of the situation in the eastern 